Thank you for joining us. I'm Keith Tebow at FRC Media. As voters get prepared for the special recall election on March 12th, we're spending our time helping uh, introduce the candidates to you so you'll make informed decisions when you go to the poll that day. I'm pleased to be joined today by one of the candidates on the ballot for mayor, Kyle Riley. Kyle, thank you. Keith, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. It means a lot for us to get that message out and uh, you know, follow the TV media letting us do that. It's important for all candidates. Well, it's definitely our, our pleasure to help, uh, help you get your word out. Let me ask you, uh, uh, Kyle, some people may remember you. You were a city council and school committee man almost 20 years ago when you started. You're aging uh, me here. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, what, what should people know about Kyle Riley, the person, before we get into some of the issues? Yeah, uh, what you should know about the person, I was born and raised here in the city. I, um, you know, my grandparents owned a bakery, Riley's Bakery, that I lived over as a young child. Um, my story is like many stories out there. I, uh, my parents divorced at a young age. We moved into Section 8 housing to try to make it. And uh, my mother did a good job of raising two boys and making sure that uh, we had the opportunity to get our education and, and move forward. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, be sitting behind my future wife in homeroom in high school on the first day of school. Uh, we dated for seven years and been married for 26 years and have six beautiful children right now. Uh, all that time really committing to the city. I've been involved in coaching basketball and baseball and being a league director and president on the board at Fogu Soccer for 20 years. Really trying to commit back to the community. Never really thinking in my mind I would someday run for mayor. Yeah. And um, I, I think I've set myself up to do so, but by accident, you know, just by really loving the city and really committing back to the city, uh, I, I feel like there's no place I'd rather be. Now, is it because of the circumstances that Mayor Correa is facing that you decided to run, or was it something you've been thinking about maybe in the short term, maybe even running this fall if, if there wasn't a recall? Uh, I came up first and said I'm running no matter what happens, uh, recall or not. Uh, but I did that through some conversations with my wife, clearly. Uh, but I noticed as uh, I'm an assistant superintendent of schools, my wife's a superintendent of schools, our conversations at home, uh, when they're not about our kids, they're about education. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found them going back to be about why is this happening in the city? Oh my God, we're embarrassed. Or look at this story. Uh, and it's not a good feeling as a citizen, you know, to sit there and say, this is how people perceive us out there, uh, not just in the city, not just in the state, but nationally. Uh, so that conversation changed in our house, and we noticed it changed. Uh, and I felt like I was just a guy sitting by the sidelines not doing anything about it. So uh, we had the hard conversation one day, and mm -hmm. it wasn't that hard for my wife. She said, I think you should do it. I think you're the right person at the right, right time. Same conversation with six kids next <laughs> that uh, wanted to make sure they were on board because I never want to put them in a position sure. that they're – um, feeling awkward about you know a move that dad would make or mom would make and uh, they were all on board I say except for my son for about two minutes but uh, when he got over the fact that people were going to talk poorly about me on social media and things he was good he's he's in there so uh, that's really how it came about so let me ask you um, because you're running for mayor I would like to make the assumption that you will be voting in favor of recalling mayor Correa at the top of that ballot when you speak with people what are you telling them in terms of why the mayor should be recalled? I really, uh, in, in most opportunities, don't have the option to say it before they say it to me, to be quite frank with you. Uh, I'm knocking on doors. We're making phone calls. We're really reaching out to the community. You've gotten flyers at your houses. Um, when I have those conversations, oh, you're running for mayor, um, I, I think it's time for a change is usually what I hear. Uh, so the conversation, I try not to focus on that. I try to focus on who I am yeah. and why I'm running, uh, why I think I can bring real leadership to the city, and why I think I can do it for a long period of time. Uh, my concern is in this race that if I didn't jump in there at 48 years old, that uh, potentially who is going to jump in there? And is it someone that's using it as a stepping stone, someone at the end of their career, uh, or is it someone that can give you 10 or 12 years and really turn the city the right way and commit to it? Uh, I often say in those conversations that uh, the perfect uh, deal would be this would be my last job that I could commit to, work hard at, and make sure Fulver is proud of me. But is it difficult not to bring up the recall when you're speaking to voters? Because without that first part being a yes, the second part, you could have all the votes on the bottom but yeah. not, not get in. I, I think our citizens are, are smart. I okay. think they're yeah. educated, and I think that when they talk to me, they're very familiar on what they need to do at the top if they want to make a change. Uh, it is an odd looking ballot. I think we're unique in that mm -hmm. as how we do things, but um, they will have the conversation about it and they will say, 
uh, after I vote yes, why should I vote for you, or I am going to vote for you. Uh, I felt the momentum um, turn over the last few weeks that I'm gaining support, uh, that when we're collecting data on who's, who you're out there voting for, mm -hmm. who's, you know, we're definitely with you, we're kind of with you, we're trying to figure it out, that uh, that piece is really growing for me, and I'm excited about that opportunity. All right, let's get into now why people should vote for Cal Riley. Um, as we're recording this, a couple of weeks prior to uh, this recording, the mayor announced that he was um, canceling the contract with Waste Zero and ending the Purple Bag Pay As You Throw program. Uh, what are your thoughts about the mayor's decision? Um, are you considering maybe returning Pay As You Throw if you would be elected mayor? What's your thoughts, I guess, on the mayor's decision and trash disposal going forward? Let me start by saying uh, my decisions won't be made uh, a month prior to an election cycle. That's not how I do business. Um, maybe it is, for instance, that we're coming out with uh, all these announcements over the last couple of weeks, but I don't think so. For me, it's more so that uh, the people have spoken. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in the purple uh, page to throw program or buying purple bags or having difficulties buying purple bags. It's deeper than that because when I speak to people, they don't want to buy the purple bags, but they also couldn't find them. The neighbors weren't complying why they were complying. It was a struggle throughout. I think it was laid out the wrong way. Uh, and I think it's closing down the wrong way. So I think there's other options out there that we have to investigate. Uh, I'm someone who definitely does my homework, does research, but assesses the situation when I get there. Uh, I spent a career doing that with personnel, with um, program development, that you really have to be in the spot talking to the people who are in charge of the program, people on the street, and people from different companies that have alternatives and ways to pick up our trash without it being a burden on the taxpayer. And that's the um, real trick at the end. There's only one sum of money in the city. If you're taking this money, no longer taking that money here, is it gonna cost you somewhere else? Mm -hmm. uh, it has been a little bit of a shell game for the last uh, couple years now. We did our exercise in my campaign headquarters to ask people that work for me on the campaign. All right, we're getting rid of these fees, but what's your tax bills? What was it like three years ago with your assessments and everything else? And what is it like now? And it was on average 30% higher and none of the people working on my campaign are making 30% more. Mm -hmm. So it's 30% higher now than three it years ago. It was three years ago. So that dovetails a little bit into your, your priorities in terms of financial stability for the city and making sure that people get the bang for their tax buck. Mm -hmm. um, how do you view, um, you know, in some ways it's sort of tied to pay as you throw because as you know, people who had private trash haulers may be coming back. It may impact the amount of money we pay to dispose our, our services. There's talk about the transfer station. Yep. But in general, in terms of city finances, um, how, do, how would you gauge the likelihood of raising taxes on people? Well, I guess what are your guidelines if you need to go to the public and say, listen, we need to raise taxes this year, be it 1%, 2%, 2 .5, whatever, you know, up to the limit. What's your philosophy in terms of making those types of decisions? Well, again, back to assessment, right? So I think we need to assess all situations, see how they are. Um, people in general don't mind paying a little bit more each year within the two and a half. Um, but when it's an override for no apparent reason, um, that's when they do mind. If we're considering paying more because it helps the sixth floor and not the first, second, and third floor it, at apartment buildings or at our tenement houses, then we're doing it for the wrong reason. So for me, it's assessing, it's really looking at what the need is, but we have to do that as a community. You know, we have to look at, this is what we want to do. These are the fees that are attached to some things. If we can reduce there, where are we going to have to find that money? Over the last two or three years, we've had uh, a, a pretty healthy state and federal government economy. Mm -hmm. uh, money's come down here that traditionally doesn't during rougher times. And those times are coming back up again. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been someone, as you stated earlier, who has served on a school committee, has served on a city council, uh, and has seen difficult times where there were teacher layoffs. There were those mm -hmm. things because they were necessary at the time. There wasn't that money coming down. We were in a financial burden. And we had to make real decisions on what we can do. I think as we look at the upcoming budget this year, as we start to plan for three years and five years and 10 years out, we need to take that into consideration as I would do a budget um, working for the school department as a you know, assistant superintendent of schools. What is our end goal? How do we get there? Then we start prioritizing off that. You know, Our uh, public servants, our first responders, our teachers, um, there's an expectation that they will make more money each year as the cost of living goes up. Right. 
of course there is. Um, so we have to keep that in mind, but we still have to have an end goal of if we're getting more money, say, for education, what are the results for that? How are we getting there? How does that translate? And if our scores are going down, but our money's going up, there's a disconnect that we have to fix. Mm -hmm. Let's get into some of the other, uh, the other topics. Public safety, of course, very important in the city. Um, you announced soon after you launched your campaign that you're looking to increase the uh, staffing at um, our uh, police fire department. Talk a little bit about that number. And I guess the question is going to be, the number is 50, yep. right, over the next four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. How do we pay for that? Uh, I came out with a press release, God, it must be three weeks ago now, right. you know, three and a half weeks ago, um, talking really about the police department. Uh, public safety is a big concern in the city. It's an ongoing concern. It seems like, you know, crime rates are there. We're seeing shootings out in the public during the day. Um, we're addressing those by adding overtime in just certain spots of the city where I if you were brought up where I was brought up, um, on Baker and Buffing Street and on Warren Street, when there's a shooting on Snell last week, there was no overtime down in that neighborhood. And there was no overtime when they're looking for um, the suspect on Tecumseh Street. You know, so th the neighbor I grew up didn't get the same attention that maybe downtown did. I'm not sure what the answer for that is. So I'm looking for a real solution. As we just talked about planning out for budget, when you say four years, 50 police officers, it sounds like a flash in the pan and you're just looking for some press. But really, we, there are some new monies coming in recreational marijuana use. I outlined that in my press release, the 3% from the state, 3% from the store owner, that I would dedicate that to a place where I think it belongs. I think when we're talking about a new business like recreational marijuana, what better for that to be used to increase public safety for anything that stems from that and from any other crime that goes in the city. So for me, I would make it a priority. If that m money, which we don't know exactly what it's gonna be, um, doesn't meet that criteria, then we have to priori prioritize in the budget to make sure that happens anyway, not just say, well, we can only get to you know, five offices, not 50. Right. We, we need to prioritize. I think that's one of the main things. If you don't feel safe in the city that you live in, um, everything else starts to dwindle for you. Education, attainment, uh, economic development, all those things fall off that public safety piece. What about um, in connection with public safety, making sure that our police officers, our firefighters, our EMT officers, have the tools, be it um, cars, uh, fire apparatus, uh, just a, a, a the facility that they're in. Um, how important is that and how do you plan on making sure that that money is available to make sure that the equipment that they use is up to date? Yeah, again, I do an overall assessment, but what I know at this point is um, we use federal funding that came down to buy um, fire trucks that are great, fantastic, everyone thinks they're wonderful, the fire department does. Um, citizens do. I have no qualms with that, except that all those trucks are going to come off at the same time they came on. Mm -hmm. So they'll come off together and financially down the road, we don't want to replace eight more trucks at the same time. So staggering some of those pieces would have been a better idea in my opinion. Um, but at the same time in the police department, the commitment to that has to be just as great. There has been um, multiple times where our police officers are in uh, cars that every light on the dashboard's open. I have a side story of a family member who's on the police force who had uh, carbon monoxide poisoning in their car. Mm -hmm. uh, all those things matter, because we're asking them to do a very difficult job. And uh, all our first responders, and we're not giving them the tools to do it. Uh, same thing with police officers, with the vest that they wear, and what grade they are, and should they have been a higher grade? Right. And not 2A, they should have been a 3A grade. And you know, as you get down to the details of it, uh, it would have been small money to make those corrections to make sure our officers are safe and we should have done it for them and their families. How important is it to engage um, our neighborhood organizations? There's a lot of neighborhood organizations. We, um, we reach out to them to help them spread their word through our resources here. Um, some mayors have been more effective in reaching out to these neighborhood groups th than others. How do you see yourself reaching out to these groups to help in the efforts of like public safety and information sharing? Well, I, I think it's huge. And I think um, probably Mayor Flanagan um, was the last who really committed to doing that, making sure that they had a liaison to each neighborhood, not just select ones, um, and having conversations with certain neighborhood groups in the city. They feel like they're left out. They feel like they have no voice. Uh, and they're holding off on Hope, hoping there's going to be a new mayor that they can re-engage with for the community, not for themselves, mm. but for their neighborhood. Uh, 
they are the boots on the ground. They're the ears in the streets of their neighborhoods. They know what's going on. Um, I know that you know when I was working at the district attorney's office and I'd go out to neighborhood meetings on a regular basis and on a city council that the information that was shared there was real information. It wasn't that you know maybe we should do this. It was this happened last night in our neighborhood next door to me. Mm. This house is vacant in our neighborhood. This business is closing because of these reasons. And to be able to gather that information throughout the city, work on those um, projects or details uh, as the mayor's office as a conduit for that through the police department and, and through other departments uh, is essential. I also think there has to be some feel good stuff that happens through the neighborhoods. Uh, and so these neighborhood leaders want their neighborhoods to not only be safe and protected and important to everyone, but they also want to be able to engage with their neighbors and make sure that they're having fun in the city. There's, there's something to that. There's something to still having a carnival and still having, um, you know, I remember, I don't know if you do, but I remember back at Plusky Park uh, 30 some odd years ago when I was a kid that I um, watched Jesus Christ Superstar mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of a park where I would have never in my situation be able to do that or go to a play or right. had that opportunity. And, uh, get back to some of those things that matter that are free for our citizens that can enjoy um, the theater and enjoy you know music and do it in a way that's safe and productive. So that, that's a quality of life issue, it obviously, really is. right? And so that leads leads to my next question, where we talked about trash. You know, by and large, people when they're at home, they're not into the minutia of a political campaign. A lot of them, right? They're looking to make sure they have a job, a roof over their head. Uh, education for their children, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, safe streets and, and what have you. What are the quality of life issues can you bring as mayor? One of the things that I bring up driving along the city, I was born and raised here, my parents still live here, um, the condition of streets tends to be an issue. That's always an issue, right? Uh, streets need to be repaired. So what types of issues, um, you mentioned some, but what type of quality of life issues can you bring as mayor? Let's talk about something like streets, getting those repaired. Yeah, and it's not just repaired, but it's cleanliness of, right? right? So it's nice to see some street sweepers out again. I, I give the administration credit for that. I mean, not everyone does everything wrong. Right. Um, but I look at that, something we'd continue uh, if I was elected. I look at some of the new streets and the oversight that's not being done. I got to assume it's not being done. Mm -hmm. That we're not seeing level streets. We're not seeing recapped um, curbstones. Look at East Main Street, for example. We've just spent a lot of money down mm -hmm. there. Um, the handicap ramps coming off the sidewalk are um, not usable in some cases. There's new lighting and new um, street lights that are going up that are wires coming out of the ground covered with a cone and the project's been going on for X number of uh, months already. That doesn't make you feel confident on what we're doing on the sixth floor. What does is when you take the money that you use for a streetscape in just certain neighborhoods that you've selected and spread that out with a real plan over time in the city that all neighborhoods are taken care of. Uh, one of the messages that I got loud and clear as I've been going to both senior centers, high rises, uh, is a real lack of ability to use their own sidewalks around their homes. Uh, and I say that because everyone says, oh, potholes in the streets, potholes in the sidewalks. Mm. So when two senior citizens in this community over the last month have told me that they've fallen out of their chair because they're trying to just get to the store, it's a problem. That's a quality of life piece that you and I don't worry about. Mm. But as yeah. someone who's committed to um, working with uh, disabled kids and families uh, in my background for the last 20 years, uh, it's something that I recognize all the time. I always think about ADA compliance and how people get around and how we make it easier for all our citizens, not just a few. So for me, when I hear that, I say, well, that must have been a, you know, an, a bad accident or whatever. Then I hear it again, and I hear they couldn't get across the street to go to the corner store because they kept asking for a light or asking for a stop sign or asking for a cone, uh, anything that would help them not be injured, and uh, it's falling on deaf ears. So for me, it's the safety piece every day. It's quality of life of getting down your street and when we do a project and ask our citizens to pay for a project through their taxes, it's done right. It's not dug up three times. It's not right. not finished. It's it's done. It's finished. Let's move on to the next one in the next neighborhood. That's a priority for us as administration. As a former school committee man and uh, longtime educator yourself, now you said you said assistant superintendent of, of schools. Um, what are some of your basic plans in terms of our education system here? Um, you know, net school spending, the mayor has pronounced that, you know, we're, uh, we're above the minimum net school spending. 
uh, for the city. Um, what are your views on that? And also plans for making our city <coughs> a better educated community? Sure. Um, I've, I've dedicated my life to um, being an educator. For me, uh, I think in the back of my head, it's always been that's how I get out of Baker and Buffington Street at Section mm -hmm. 8 is that uh, my mom pushed me to be educated. She said, you're going to college. I re-entered college again, finished my undergrad and got my master's degree in educational leadership because I saw it as a vehicle to do something great for myself and my family and hopefully for my community. Um, minimum net school spending is just that. That's what we're mandated to do. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in a, a few school districts that are well above minimum net school spending. So that's a piece of it. The other piece is what are we doing with it, right? And so I consider myself out of the five candidates, the education candidate in the race. I've started as a teacher and gone to a vice principalship and then promoted to a principal, promoted to a director of special education, and promoted to an assistant superintendent. I'm sure Mr. School. Coogan would challenge you on that, but okay. <laughs> no, I, and I appreciate Mr. Coogan being a teacher and a vice principal. I, I really look at it as um, I kept growing. Mm -hmm. I really did an education. That's not a knock on him. It's a hopefully a, a pat on my back that I kept moving on and making sure that I understood in different communities, I understood uh, in different school settings, both suburb and urban, um, what can get done, what's difficult at certain places that it's not difficult at others, mm -hmm. and then how to make sure that money is used in a way that helps children. Uh, I have been in charge of budgets from you know $40,000 to my own piece in Haver was $15 million. And there is no more fluctuating budget than a special education budget. Mm -hmm. You don't know who's driving in and right. um, taking up residence in the community services. the next day and what services they need. So uh, I'm very used to working with a large budget, but also a moving budget. Mm -hmm. So for me, I feel like I would be the best candidate to be ex officio member of the school committee. In doing so, be able to work with good people like Mr. Coogan on the school committee sure. and uh, make sure that we're advancing kids and setting up programs that benefits our kids in our community. Uh, if our numbers are going up minimum net school spending and we're touting that as an achievement, but our scores are going down on MCAS, this, there's a disconnect we've got to fix somewhere. Right. I want to make sure I get to some other topics. Sure. So I apologize if, if I'm no interrupting problem. you between now and the end of the, the program. Um, economic development, always a, a big issue here in Fall River. Jobs, getting people back to work. Um, Mayor Correa's administration severed its ties with the former Fall River Office of Economic Development, now the BCEDC. Uh, what's your thoughts on jump-starting economic development? Would you want to work again with the BCEDCC? What are your thoughts? I want to work with whoever's going to um, be the best for Fall River. I have uh, no c connection to Mr. Fiola coming back or not coming back. Uh, I think it's been a personality conflict that's happened 18 months ago, and the citizens of Fall River have suffered because of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. It seems like very little is going on with economic development. I know. I know. I watch the paper when there's a new announcement that somebody's moving from this place to a bigger place and the mayor is lo lauding that as, you know, mm -hmm. we did this. That's not economic development, though. It's people making choices in their businesses for the most part. Um, I think we have to be um, proactive, be aggressive in making sure that companies are coming here, staying here, paying uh, a, a fine wage and making sure the environment that people work in, in our city are up to standard. So for me, I think we... Again, the third time I said assess, but I really do think we need to assess that situation on its merits, not on personalities, but on its merits. Who's going to help Florida? How are we going to build a team either inside City Hall or use a consultant to best benefit the city? And until you're sitting there in that seat, anybody can say anything they want up to March 12th. Right. But until you're sitting there in that exactly. chair and look at the assessment of what's happening, what could happen, uh, and beginning to talk to businesses yourself as a mayor, you don't really know the answer to that. So let me just make sure you're, I'm clear about mm -hmm. what you're saying here. The city right now is looking for an economic development director. Mm -hmm. um, if you're elected on the 12th, you're not necessarily committed to that, or you just want to assess and maybe there may be other Yeah, I'm not necessarily committed to that because I think um, it's moved ahead in a direction that is due to, a, again, a personality conflict that has ended the ties. Mm -hmm. And so now let's do something internally that will continue to sever those ties. That may or may not be the best thing in the world. I don't know who we've hired. We've been 18 months, really, without a real commitment with anybody. We've been um, not filled that role since. So like any other position that I've held, that I've been in charge of um, several, you know, hundreds of people, 
we go and advertise. We look at who's the best out there, what the need is around us, mm -hmm. and then we hire the best possible uh, people for that. I feel the same way about my administration. Um, I don't have someone in mind for, and then you can fill in the job after mm -hmm. that. I don't. I walk into here that I want to be a mayor. I want to hire the best team that's going to be here in the city for a long period of time and to turn the city around. We have so much potential. And uh, with between giving out jobs to friends and investors and things like that that have gone on for the last few years, we're missing our chance. We're really squandering an opportunity here. Uh, a Riley administration would go out there and seek the best and the brightest and make sure that I stuck by that. And I'd ask anyone to challenge me uh, on that a week after March 12th when I'm elected to say, you lied, your cousin just got a job or it's right. it, absolutely not. Okay. Opioid e epidemic, uh, a problem not just in Fall River, but obviously across across the, uh, the the country. What can a mayor do to help stem the tide of the crisis here? It's not. It, it may not <coughs> be just as easy as a public policy decision. So what what role do you see yourself playing? Yeah, and I, I feel like you know clearly it's a national epidemic. Clearly, it's not just going on in Fall River. Um, but the mayor does, uh, first and foremost, hold the office that is a conduit for other organization, nonprofits to get together and discuss where the best direction to go is. I, I thought for a long time as a um, special ed director or principal in the Bedford, where I've worked with kids that uh, either had addicti addiction problems or families that have, that we weren't successful educating them until we resolved some of those pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I worked with, um, in New Bedford, uh, an organization called PACA that was, you know, like a lot of our agencies down here, uh, that they would really give wraparound services to those uh, children and to their families. Mm. And so I think, uh, as mayor, you'd look for your city to look at those wraparound services. I was thrilled to see um, that Joe Kennedy came down with a check for $3.8 million for a star, mm. but even more thrilled to see that it was going to be used for those kind of wraparound services, for um, psych services, for nurse practitioners, for counselors, and that you're getting to the heart of the problem. Also back to education, we need to continue to educate our children, right. make sure that we're sending the message um, clearly like this is how you get to your goal mm -hmm. and you can't go this way, you have to go this way and how do we help you move through that. Uh, we have excellent educators in the city and I've, I've worked with excellent educators everywhere I've gone. Uh, they put so much time and effort into what they do right. that they serve not only as a teacher, but right. also as a social worker and everything else. And how do we get the message out to um, real social workers and real counselors to support the families that they serve? Are you in favor of the second star facility up on Weaver Street for more beds recovery in Fall River? I'm not. I, I think uh, we service the beds that we have right now. There are many places in our region that could service um, or host those beds and still service for other people. What happens is in many of those cases that it's not even for the rights who are getting those beds mm. and then they're um, comfortable and come back to the community that the beds are in. And so as we, we're not dealing with our own issues, now we're dealing with other communities' issues as well. It's not that I don't support um, people with addiction and make sure that they are um, serviced the way they should be, but I'd go back to it's not about the bed, it's about the services that come after the bed. Mm -hmm. All right, final minute. How can people find out more information about the Kyle Riley campaign? Yeah, it's, uh, we have been as transparent and as honest as we can possibly be as a campaign. We have uh, opened up a campaign office. I believe we're the only ones who've done that. I'm 758 Bedford Street. There's usually someone there. There will be someone there for the next four weeks to the end of the campaign. Um, we are available by phone at 774-488-5676. Uh, www.kylerileyformayor.com and on Facebook, Kyle Riley for Mayor. Um, we have put out information, pictures, stories, you name it. Um, when you call that number and for some reason someone doesn't pick it up, that email goes to me, goes to my cell phone and I call you back myself. I want you to reach out. I want you to tell me this was a lousy interview and why it should have been better. I want you to tell me your ideas are bad and I also want you to tell me when they're good. I need that barometer at all times as a leader to make sure that I'm doing what's right for the city. Kyle, thank you very much. Thanks Good so luck much. You. Thank you. Thank you all for watching, and please make a point to vote on Tuesday, March 12th. Have a great day.